to give um, Katie Lapari Shu a call, make sure she's not having trouble logging in. Dave, you'll do that. Thanks. All right, it is 7.01 and you are live. Okay. <clears throat> All right, Dave is um, just checking on Katie Lapari Shu, make sure she's not having a problem logging in. In the meantime, I will call this meeting to order. It's May 18th. This is the meeting of the City of Oneonta Common Council. And um, would the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Herzig? Here. Councilmember Murphy? Here. Councilmember Davies? Here. Councilmember Risberger? Here. Council Member Lapari Shum. Council Member Carson. Here. Council Member Harrington. Here. Council Member Rafter. Here. Council Member Drenick. Here. Okay. Dave, did you have any luck contacting Katie? Not yet. Okay. All right. Look, we're going to move forward. So tonight um, I had invited uh, the folks from Springbrook to make a presentation on a very exciting project uh, that they are proposing to move forward with, which is the renovation of the upper floors of the Ford Block building. Uh, something that has been spoken about for as long as most of us can remember. People saying, what a beautiful space. Why can't that be converted to uh, good quality apartments? Uh, and um, we now have a proposal to do so, which I'm very excited about. So I, I asked um, uh, Patricia Kennedy and along with her team to make a presentation to the council on uh, exactly what their plans are, and then they'll be available to answer questions after the presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Patricia, and also you'll be able to share screens Mm -hmm. um, you know, if uh, I'm sure you'll have stuff to share with everybody. Yep, we have lots. All, all yours, Patricia. Thanks so much, Gary. Really appreciate it. And it's great to see. I'm on Zoom all the time, like I know all of you are. And it's great to see some familiar faces that I don't usually see on Zoom. So it's, it's great to see everyone and glad to have you here. Uh, with me tonight, I have Michelle Sherwood, and she's our executive assistant. She's going to be doing the presentation. I am lost without her. She knows that. Seth Haight, I'm sure you all know Seth. He's our chief operating officer, and he's really spearheaded this project and very excited about it. Very excited that we're at this point um, as well. And we have Scott Townsend. And he is our architect from 3T. And he has been like everybody who's been involved in this project over the last year and a half, patient, creative, fun to work with. So, um, and he's gonna be sharing some of the things we're gonna be looking at with the Ford project. Mm -hmm. um, and as Gary said, we, I was one of those people who walked downtown Onion and said, why aren't they? <laughs> I would love if I were, younger and singer that I would love to live downtown. And then as we started digging into it, there's a reason it's expensive. It's expensive to do it right. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful building. Part of the reason we hired Scott and his team is that he knows how to take good care of beautiful downtown buildings. So I um, wanna talk to you about the project and ask for a little bit more support. Um, so that we can get on the finish line and we'll show you our projected timeline, which I think you'll be as excited about as I am. So Michelle, you wanna share the screen? Thanks. Well, I could probably start and stop with this picture because it is just an absolutely beautiful building. And we looked at the Ford block as, um, a way to support Springbrook's mission. And we'll talk about that. Seth will be talking about that by creating housing and employment opportunities. And what we found years ago, um, as many large employers and smaller employers found is we had lots of jobs, but we need to attract young professional people to live in our community. And they often had a tough time finding um, affordable housing that was um, non-student related. 
So you know that we have a long history in Oneonta and we've grown with Oneonta. We now have 1400 employees and we realized that we could only be successful as the downtown of Oneonta was. We have so many of our homes and programs that rely on the good people who live in Oneonta and who come to Oneonta to be our very valuable employees. So we're looking at this as an investment in our downtown community. I should also say that we've done a project with a developer in Binghamton, a much larger project on the Endicott and Johnson shoe factories, which is right by the, Luke, you're nodding. Do you know the buildings? No, I was, I was not, not the building. I was just trying to picture it in my head. That's why I was nodding. But. Yeah, it's, it's right by the new school of pharmacy down there. And we were a partner with Reagan Development and they did 120 apartments of which um, about 20% were for Springbrook. And it was a great opportunity. And we thought, let's try this on ourselves, but let's try it in our hometown where we know the people and the people know us. So the Ford Block project, Seth, why don't you just describe the project for people, you know, better than anyone. I have been on the third floor once. But. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's every bit of what Patricia said. It's um, a great opportunity. We'll talk about the whys in a second, but the project itself, um, the Ford Block spans from 186 to 212 Main. So it is really the, the chunk of that building that is the breezeway that connects uh, Main Street to the parking garage all the way down through Key Bank. And then the floor beneath it that has some um, spaces and opportunities. And of course, the two floors above the commercial spaces there. So that's what's referred to as the Ford block. Um, the project overall, as Patricia said, it's a renovation project similar to what we've done um, in urban renewal and repurpose um, is, is what we're calling it for um, 22 to 24 market rate residential units, mainly um, singles and a few doubles. So like I said, uh, singles, a few doubles, averaging about 700 square feet um, each. The whole idea is to preserve uh, what we see as a beautiful building. Um, you look down Main Street and my eye has always gone to that building. I think one of the really cool things about it is it has that opening uh, to Muller Plaza. So you get to see a lot of it and it has those beautiful sort of uh, curved windows and, and facades that are, have been there for a long time. So we, we look at, looked at it and thought, geez, it really has some, some great bones. What could be a possibility uh, for it? So we will do all the improvements. We need to add an elevator. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, there is also a part of the plan is to revive some of the vacant commercial spaces like I talked about that are down um, in the ground floor level, which goes out onto Water Street behind um, that have been, you know, commercial properties in the past. And so if you put that all together, it could really be kind of a neat overall project. Um, the upper floors, as you can see by the pictures on the right, it's, it's wide open. The building is... Um, completely, you know, sort of bare. Uh, if you can look straight down the middle from end to end, I don't know how many people have had a chance to, to go up there, but um, it really hasn't been changed or, or you know, renovated much at all um, since back in its days when it was used for man manufacturing. So lots of opportunities. You can get a vision right away. Uh, as Patricia said, it's gorgeous. You can see out in the back of the valley. It's absolutely breathtaking the views from the building. And so for the whys, um, Patricia mentioned it. Um, we looked at a convergence of lots of things in our mission and lots of things that we thought were really neat things to do for the city of Oneonta in, in collaboration with the city of Oneonta. But um, we oftentimes hear when we're hiring professionals that it's difficult to find a place to rent in Oneonta when they come. Um, it can be a challenge to find uh, rental properties that are not student based. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of been hanging in our minds over the years. We thought, you know, with a footprint of our size in Otsego County and, and Oneonta and beyond, 
we thought we'd love to contribute to a project in downtown Oneonta that would help um, downtown and certainly show our presence and contribute to the revitalization um, efforts there. Um, we look at employment opportunities for the people that we serve. There's a tremendous number of partnerships with the tenants in the building that have been successful and we look to expand those as well as opportunities uh, within the city of Oneonta for uh, volunteering or work that can take place with the people we serve. Um, that's all part of what, what we envision for this partnership that we have and that we want to grow with, with the city of Oneonta. So that's the whys. Um, the plans, um, I think Scott, it'd be great. Would you um, walk us through, these are uh, plans developed by Scott at 3T. I just should say um, in selecting Scott, it was clear when he came to the building when we were taking proposals for the plans, uh, Scott got the vision right away, and uh, you could see by his resume, he is an expert at this renewal and repurposing of urban buildings that have locations like the Ford, Ford Block does in cities, and uh, he couldn't, I think he was as excited as I've ever seen anybody walking through that building. He just, oh, that's cool, we can save that. Look at the facade, that wall is neat. Geez, we don't have to touch that, it, that works, and that was really what we wanted to do, is honor the history of the building. Um, but make it really neat as far as upgrades go. So Scott, I'm gonna ask you to walk us through the second and third floor plans as we're showing. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, uh, and I, I wanna say it's been great working with Springbrook. It's nice to be here in front of everybody in Oneana and the Common Council. And, uh, and, and Seth is right. The first time I saw this building, um, it's, it's a fantastic building. It's a great main street. It's very walkable. It's nice that it has basically three facades that are active and there's a lot of windows. Um, our firm, just real briefly, our firm does a lot of uh, historic uh, adaptive reuse projects. Um, I would say 30 to 40% of our projects are, are that. And uh, one thing I can say is with all the various people that we work with in, in various municipalities, it quite frankly is hard to find uh, uh, buildings that are suitable, as naturally suitable as what's, what this building is for what they wanna do. It, it's, it's really perfect. Um, getting back to you know why was it uh, vacant this long? I can't answer all those questions, but what I can do is look at it from a perspective of a building. Um, Patricia said it right at the beginning that uh, doing a historic rehab uh, and adaptive reuse is not, it's not the easiest endeavor. Quite frankly, it's, it's oftentimes easier to build on vacant land uh, because there are a lot of regulations. There's a lot of hoops to go through. Uh, we will be going through uh, SHPO, which is State Historic Preservation, and, uh, and they will work it at the state level to get National Park Service um, uh, so that we can get historic tax credits. And that will be at the federal level and at the state level. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just really quickly uh, walk you through it. The thing that was tough about it, the upstairs was, uh, most people don't know, and I couldn't quite believe it when I saw it, was there's actually no stair between the second and third floor. You have to climb the ladder. And it's, it's, it's a, honestly, it's a little befuddling. I, I, I've never seen a building that just kind of lost its stairs. That's um, why I only went up it once, Scott. <laughs> Once it was a ladder. <laughs> I can understand. Yeah, it's a vertical approach. It doesn't ex obviously, that doesn't exactly meet code. So that's one of the things we have to do right away is get all the way down. Up, um, and those stairs that you see in the center there are, uh, they do go from, as most people know, walking down uh, Main Street in, the, in front of the facade. Those are the exit stairs from the upper floors out into the street. So we have to extend those up. Uh, what we're looking at is uh, the, the layout. Um, the elevator is on the upper sheet. I don't know if you can point to things, Michelle, as we go. Um, thank you. So the elevator is up there. That's what we have to do. There is no elevator um, in the building as we speak. There are remnants of, um, of what used to be there that used to be a vertical lift or elevator, but uh, we do have to modify the openings. Uh, 
so that they meet uh, current requirements and, and modern equipment and uh, handicap accessibility, you know, size and everything. Uh, so we're doing that. And then as you get up, the elevator will get you from what uh, Seth was calling and what I believe is called the breezeway connecting the garage and the, and the, the main street, which we'll see in a little bit. Uh, that will bring you up and these will be a private elevator. Uh, so we have no problems with uh, people having security and safety as they should going to their house, you know, uh, apartments and homes. And when you look at this building, you can kind of see it's fairly natural segmentation. Those walls that are a darker color are the existing bearing walls uh, that we're keeping. You can see a little bit in photographs that when Seth was talking about it. So we're working with those. And that's something we want to do is work with the building. Uh, and then we're able to get, uh, you can see over to your, your left, uh, how many different types of uh, apartments we're getting. It's the vast majority are, are one bedrooms with some studios and a couple of two bedrooms. Uh, we're doing everything as efficiently as we can. We're, we're lining things up with windows. So one nice thing that is, you know, beautiful in the space, even if you haven't been there, you saw it on uh, Seth's uh, screen be before, is that it's full of windows. Um, so these will be brightly lit studios, It'll be nice ventilation. Uh, when we're working with the National Park Service, we will be, basically we, we are, any replacement, with the replacement windows we put in, they have to replicate what's there. So I don't want anybody to be worried about us doing anything to the facade. We're going to be cleaning it and restoring it, putting in new windows and, you know, and fixing whatever masonry we may need to. Uh, so it will be beautifully restored and there for decades, you know, obviously with some incidental maintenance. But you can see we have a hallway that comes down uh, straight from the uh, elevator and then there are exit stairs to the front and everything here meets code. The tricky part with a lot of these buildings just as a side note is making sure we don't have what they call dead end corridors. So we don't have, you know, fire safety issues. And my dog says hi. Um, so, and, and, and you'll see that we have things looking out the back and out to the main street. And then obviously out to the plaza to the lower part. You can go on to the next one. This is one of those buildings or drawings will make it never look as good as the actual photograph. It's just a, it's a beautiful building. But uh, just by looking at this, um, I think everyone really gets a sense of the magnitude of the replacements for the windows uh, that we're gonna have to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an inexpensive endeavor to do it and do it in a manner that will be not only acceptable by uh, historic uh, preservation codes at the national and state level, but also as for you, you know, on Main Street, you know, we don't want to do anything that will hurt the integrity of, of what's there. And so, and we're going to keep basically the, the facade. We are not trying to add on anything uh, that would, you know, detract. Quite frankly, we're, we're, we're trying to respect exactly what's there and enhance it. Go ahead to the next one, Michelle. So one of the reasons we're here tonight, the upper floors were, those are, you know, we showed one plan, but it's basically two floors that are stacked and replicating um, for the most part. What we want to do is talk about, and this is where everyone's, you know, working together and considering it, is the breezeway. Now, I do know that you're having a, uh, a long range project that has, you know, been out to bid and you're, you're starting to hopefully work towards um, where there's a, it's, it's critical to have a connection from the back of the building up to the main street. Right now it's the garage. Uh, so what we wanted to do is how do, we, how do we capture the space and make it so that it becomes a place where you're entering into Oneana and it, you know, it, it tells a story and it, it feels good by doing so after you, you've come through. So what you're seeing is this is... Um, pictures that we captured off things that we took. Um, and this is the way it is right now. Uh, the bridge is important for us in the concept that you'll be seeing in a second, uh, because what we want to do is carry people through with some elegance and grace and tie 
the exterior and the interior together. And as a matter of fact, we didn't show any details, uh, but we like to do something on the front, on the main street, that will continue that all the way through. We'll see in a second. So right here, we'll have some images of various things that capture that we want to do uh, in the space. And we call these basically inspirational images. Like, what are we thinking? What are the components? And we want to do nice lighting for not only uh, the brick, but we'll, you'll see in a second, we want to do it as a display area, uh, a place not only to go through and rush through, but to stop, pause, learn, enjoy. Um, and then the upper one with a lot of the wood, what you're starting to see is we're looking at the the turnbuckle systems that are actually evident in your current bridge coming off the garage. And then, you know, some uh, can lights that we can use a spotlight and benches uh, that the brown one in the middle where the footsteps are going over that that's actually the tile uh, sample uh, that we're showing. And we're trying to take inspiration again from the bridge and how do we, how do we make going from one place to another an elegant and pleasant experience? So what you're seeing here is this is our rendering of what it will be, you know, as we move on. And this is coming from the back bridge off of the, um, uh, from the garage area. And those are the existing stairs, which will all be repainted. We're proposing that we redo uh, the flooring. And you can see that we're doing different textures to, to show different areas. One is a pathway, anything that's a lighter color is kind of a, a place you can stop and pause. It's not necessarily going from point A to point B. Uh, what you're seeing on the uh, right-hand side of the rendering is there'll be a little sign for um, uh, the four block apartments. You know, the name is pending, I know, but we'll have some kind of sign and those are mailboxes you're seeing. And that is the elevator shaft that we have to have. And not only do we have to have the elevator shaft on this floor, we also, by code and law, have to bring it all the way down into the lower level, which is on the Water Street side. Uh, and what we're thinking is, you know, would be all new lighting, new drop ceiling systems. You can see it's a darker color up above. And then what we're doing is bringing in the wood and we would make the finish of the wood the same as the bridge that goes over to the garage. So it all ties in. So as you're looking down through, it kind of, it just naturally brings your, your eye right through. And then what we're doing is, and you can see a little bit on the on the rendering to the left, upper left, we're we're using the brick wall as display. I know right now there's a, a lot of pinup boards and stuff that, but what we want to do is, you know, initial discussions have been, you know, and, and I know we talked about it when we initially talked is maybe the historic society can start talking about the history of Oneana, or it can be um, places where there's some art centers or galleries that want to you know, rent the space or use it to display. So you can teach about Oneana, you can do some things that are kind of inspirational. So it's really, the whole idea is it becomes a, a flexible space that can change over time and one year to the next, it feels a little bit different, but you might have some core history uh, that, that's always going to be there. Uh, and what you're seeing on to the right is basically the, the finishes that we're, we're proposing. I, I just want to be clear. We're not locked in. We're not coming in saying this must be it, but we're saying this is what we propose and we think is a, a nice direction for it. And this is something that would be uh, extremely low maintenance and then it would hold up extremely well and, and present itself really well uh, to the public. Everyone can feel good about it. You can go to the next one, Michelle. Thanks. So these are the um, floor plans and ceiling plans. The upper left-hand one is the, the floor pattern that you saw there with the elevator in the center. And then what we're showing is uh, a gallery space across the way. Uh, and then the little mailboxes to the, to the left of that. And towards the main street side, and you'll see a rendering of it the next slide, is we're looking at a couple of places where you could have a couple of places to sit. People naturally nowadays, hey, I'll meet you there. So, you know, they're not just hanging. They can actually sit and wait and, or if they're waiting for somebody to go up, up above. Uh, again, everything will be secure. The floors will be secure from one another. So 
we'll work out the security system of anybody going up to the apartments. You know, it would only be them allowed to go up, you know, whether it's a, a key or a fob, we'll work through that. Uh, and then the, the lower plan uh, is just showing the reflected ceiling plan. So that's the wood slats and the lighting and displays. The lower floor, which is to your right, um, that would be all new finishes, new finishes going up the stairs, painted stairs. But again, we have to bring the elevator all the way down uh, by code. We do have to do some modifications in that area. Uh, so we're taking out a couple of walls, we're refinishing areas uh, and bringing the shaft down and the elevator all the way down. So anybody coming on either floor will have handicap accessibility. All right, Michelle, thank you. And this is the same space. This is actually looking at it from uh, coming from Main Street and going back towards the garage. And this is how it presents itself. We're, we are just picking out images. Uh, obviously, <laughs> we're not the experts on what images should be there, but just we're implying about what the feel is, the scale is. We have a little, you know, it's kind of playing off the cable system idea of, of what's in the bridge. And that could be, you know, your museum hanging, and it could be your little divider between the little, what we call the nodes in the, the sitting area. And that's, that's our presentation of what we're trying to do with the Ford Block. It's exciting. And what we have here is um, we put together a presentation of, uh, or an estimate for the whole project. And what you're seeing is this shows all the various components uh, that, that we have to do. And it's obviously totaling about $4.5 million. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we did is we broke it down into the three categories. Um, all the lobby and the elevator work that we just talked about, and that's the elevator going all the way up. Um, it's important to note when you do an elevator, the elevator has a certain cost but then there's all of preparation so that the elevator can be accepted, widening the holes, structurally doing it, right? Um, putting up the walls, the shafts, the, the sound insulation, um, running uh, mechanical units. Uh, you have to have special smoke alarms. We have to put a pit in the uh, an elevator pit down at the very lowest floor. Uh, that's in there with some miscellaneous drainage. Um, and then we did that. And so anything affiliated with that and then anything work that we foreshadowed that was affiliated with the lobby, uh, a lot of it's uh, miscellaneous um, removals and then uh, uh, refinishing, but it's also uh, incidentals like adjusting uh, the heating and cooling systems, uh, electrical work uh, to get it to the presentation that, that you saw. It's all the components broken out. Great. Thanks, Scott. It was a very thorough kind of look at it, but really exciting to look at that um, real opportunity in the, um, in the entryway. So this is our timeline, um, which is, you know, we've been waiting a long time and it's pretty aggressive. We've done some preliminary look um, at the building um, for lead and asbestos and all those kind of good things. So we're hoping to meet with the City of Oneana Planning Committee in June. Um, hopefully everything will go really well there. And in the summer, we're looking at having our construction documents, financing all put together with a look at sending the project out to bid in September, construction through and project opening in fall of 2022. Um, and as part of that, this is really hoping that the city can enter into a partnership with us in helping to fund the elevator as we enhance that entryway, that bridgeway from the garage um, to Oneonta. So um, we're incredibly, incredibly excited about it. And it, I know all of you know Springbrook and um, hopefully the good work that we do, we do good work but we're also incredibly proud of all of our buildings. We take great pride in them because we look at our buildings as being um, accessibility and your environment we feel for everyone, especially for people with developmental disabilities are incredibly important that a building work with you and that we maintain it to the highest degree. So 
Um, I can say that we would be good stewards of that building. It will always look good. It will always work well. That's part of our ethic and everything that we do at Springbrook. And um, we've had great partners to be able to do that. I wanna say I appreciate your time on this beautiful evening. Nobody wants to be in front of their computer screen for another presentation, but I really appreciate the time that the council has given to us to present this. Um, Gary has been so um, helpful with his time and understanding and ideas. And I'm just excited to present this project as a pathway to continuing with the good things that are happening in downtown Oneonta. So if there are any questions for us, Gary, is that next? Yeah, Patricia, before you, we Mayor? start, before, no, no, Gary is good. Okay, all right. And I'll, and I'll call you Ms. Patricia. Oh, okay. <laughs> but um, I just, um, before we get to questions, a couple of things. I just want to um, make sure one, uh, that we make it clear that both the elevator and the walkway is going to be an ongoing partnership that the elevator um, will have public access so that uh, to the lower levels of the park, lower level of the parking garage, so that the, the public will be able to use that as an access point to go from Main Street to the lower level of the parking garage and vice versa, of course, from the lower level of the parking garage back up to Main Street. And the walkway itself will be a dual purpose lobby of your building um, an elegant lobby to a beautiful building, as well as a renewed walkway that will be a gateway to our downtown from people coming to the parking garage. So it's a double partnership Absolutely. there. Um, I do want to say that um, uh, Patricia and I have been talking about this, it seems like it's probably three years now, at least two years. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, I, I just, um, through COVID and all, um, Springbrook's uh, perseverance, uh, dedication to making this happen, uh, despite the financial setbacks of COVID, um, you know, have really been meaningful and greatly appreciated. And finally, um, New York State's Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul was in town today. And uh, as we walked around, I, uh, she wanted to know what was happening with our DRI. I showed her the upper floors of the four block building from the outside, uh, told her that what was being proposed by Springbrook. And, you know, her comments were, this is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what the DRI is supposed to all be about. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, um, we'll open it up to any questions from council members. Uh, Len Carson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Patricia and your staff, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And I truly appreciate the public-private partnership that you were suggesting tonight. Um, you know, this is very exciting. And this is what Oneana is about. Um, as a community, as a whole, um, getting partnerships with those organizations such as yours, well-known, well-respected. And, and I look forward to um, a long-term relationship um, when you're talking about the 22 to 24 market rate housing at 700 square feet, are you comfortable releasing a, a price figure that you think that each apartment's going to be renting out at? Yeah, we had that. I, um, 900, right? So, yeah, right around a thousand for yep. for each. Okay. Thank yeah, you, sir. We did yep. a market study. You know, looked at the average prices mm -hmm. in Oneonta per square foot. What was available? And it fit in with our pro forma and our budgeting at, at that level. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, um, I look forward to uh, to touring it. I guess we're going to be looking at it on Thursday. Yeah. And hopefully the, the mayor didn't make the lieutenant governor climb up that ladder, Patricia, that you were just <laughs> describing. So. No, I promise to wear flats and not the high heels that I did the first time. I'm just not going to do that again. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Len. Good to see you. To Dave Risberger. Yes, I just want to uh, echo what uh, Councilman Carson said. Um, I want to thank you for all the work you've done in this building. I think this is very exciting for the city of Oneana. That building is set 
uh, vacant upstairs for far too long. Um, the question I have is more procedural. I notice on your timeline, um, starting in June, um, you were going to be meeting and presenting to the city planning committee. Did you mean the city planning commission? Yes, I did. I so. Yeah. Yeah. There's a big difference. So that's why mm -hmm. I was asking. Sorry. Yes. It's Either way, I'll be there. <laughs> okay, great. Great. Well, if I'm in the wrong place in the wrong time, send me to the right place. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Sorry for Thanks the again. misunderstanding. Okay. Mark Davies, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I just want to echo and echo again on the sentiments of the other council members. I think this is a wonderful partnership. I really appreciate the vision that you all have for that particular building. I think many of us, and Patricia, you started and you mentioned this, but we've walked around and talked about why aren't there these uh, great apartments in those upper floors. And it's just really neat to see that I think in one of the more, the more spectacular buildings that we have in our main street that we're going to be achieving that in a few short years, thanks to the, the work on you all from you all. So thank you. I love the vision and I hope that we'll see more of these projects in the future. Hope so. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? I will add that um, probably many of you have been on the Springbrook campus, but um, if you have not, um, Patricia doesn't build anything that is not absolutely beautiful. No. So, um, you know, uh, I just have great confidence that whatever is built there is going to be uh, first class, uh, top to bottom. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, Patricia, Scott, Seth, um, Michelle, um, really appreciate you taking the time to come here and make this presentation. This is also being broadcast uh, public, so it gives a public uh, glimpse uh, at what is being proposed here. And um, we'll be talking soon about next steps and moving right. this forward. And we'll send you the slides if you'd like to have them. That would be great. Okay, that would be great. send it to you so you have it for them. Well, thanks. That, and again, good to see everyone. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Bye -bye. Nice meeting everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. I'm going to get my screen back open here. Give me one second. Okay. Next on the agenda is uh, there's no public hearings, but we will entertain um, any petitioners. If there's anybody in the waiting room who would like to um, speak their mind to the council. Um, Carrie, do we have anybody? One person, it's the cell caller from the 287 number, just admitted them. I'm sorry, what, what was that, Carrie? You have one from the 287 number. Um, do we have a name of a person? Did not provide. Okay. Um, are they here to speak? Caller from 287-5206, if you could identify yourself and if you'd like to speak. I think there's a misunderstanding. My name is Tom Wise. I was calling okay. to actually uh, see the proposed project by Springbrook and I think that I missed it. Oh, and okay. Trying to get in and it was difficult and finally somebody let me in and I missed it, so. All right, it's, it's Tom, it's all recorded and you can watch it on YouTube. Okay. So. And let me just say for everybody, Tom Wise was a member of the project selection committee that reviewed all of the downtown improvement fund grant applications and made the decisions on the awards, including this project's award. So thank you for your work on that, Tom. Oh, my so, so he feels a, a little ownership for this, <laughs> deservedly, deservedly so. We went to look at our work this week with you and you had said that this was being presented. So that's why I was trying to jump on and see the presentation, but yeah. I, I'll look for the recording. The project selection committee uh, headed by Kim Muller um, decided last week to take a victory lap. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and they walked all around, did the whole loop around downtown uh, to see the fruits of their work. You know, the new awnings that are coming up, the new signages, um, uh, you know, all the good things that are happening here. So thank, thank you, you, Tom. Thank you. Carrie, we have nobody else to speak? 
I showed Mr. Wise as a separate connection, so I still have that yeah. 287 number. But other than okay. that, no, uh, I do not. Okay, um, whoever's calling in from 287, uh, 5206, are you here to speak to the council? That was me. Oh, you're in two places. Okay. Uh, oh, 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 no, that was hung. Jeez. My mistake. Okay. That was all right. No problem. Right. No okay. problem. <laughs> Welcome to the world of Zoom. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> We're going to move on to our board and commission reports. Board of Public Service, Council Member Mark Jenick. Thank you, Mayor. The Board of Public Service met on May 6th and they had a busy agenda, old business, 1012 Forest Avenue had been held over four times in order for the um, owner to attend, but with the fourth time and the lack of attendance, um, the appeal for their fire alarm certifications fee was denied. Um, in between that and uh, the uh, additional um, business that they had, uh, they approved a motion that penalties on water and sewer bills will be waived pending decisions on appeals from here on in so that things don't accrue while, um, the, um, while this takes place. Uh, 13 College Park Drive, a sewer bill fee appeal. There was a leak. I think I talked about this last month. There was a leak under a pool house. The water had been turned off, but somehow or another, uh, it just kept on coming. The water department um, was called. They helped find the leak. Um, Bottom line is the sewer fee um, bill was uh, upheld. Um, and then we broke for uh, additional information, the high card, used, uh, what used to be called a high card, now called a continuous flow card, uh, sports some new verbiage that says basically the date and our records show that the last meter reading at your property at such and such indicates a material increase in water used during the month of such and such, which doesn't seem like um, a lot, but it's a huge improvement in terms of information. Uh, so that has been instituted as I understand it. At 83rd Street, an update on that unsafe building. We had talked about um, many times um, that was the one that had multiple people living in various areas in makeshift um, rooms built and all kind. Of, anyway, bottom line of it is the violations have all been corrected and that unsafe has been lifted. So that's progress. In new business, um, Humphreys at 437 Main Street had turned off their water somehow in September, but one way or the other, um, water just kept going coming um, and nobody really is sure why, but um, the chair um, being who she is, said um, while the appeal was denied, uh, she'd be writing a letter personally to, to the Community Foundation of Otsego County to see whether or not they might be able to help the owner of that business cover um, that water leak. No idea where it came from or, um, or why it stopped, but um, so that was an awfully nice thing. 95 Center Street, uh, water sewer bill, bill appeal has been tabled until next month to allow for attendance. 11 Morgan Avenue, uh, it's a water sewer bill appeal. Uh, they were asking for a reduction in the sewer bill based on pool usage, which they were very good about providing all the information on. And um, because of all of the uh, stellar uh, documentation, that appeal was approved and um, they saved themselves $48.16. At 106 Center Street, the sidewalk maintenance appeal of snow, yeah, snow. Um, removal, that appeal was denied. And then finally at 11 Kearney Street, uh, an unsafe building appeal, which is a tricky one because it's um, one tenant that should just about be moved out now and then another tenant that's there for the full long haul. Um, but because of um, the tenants, no access provided to the building, um, the building has been declared unsafe relative to specific apartments, which will allow garbage cleanup, which is really required. Um, and then window repair, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it was a busy meeting, but a productive meeting. And um, that was it. Questions, anyone? Yes, Dave. Dave Risperger. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of information there, Mark. Yep. Um, you caught me off guard with 95 Center Street. I was trying to catch up to see if that was- <laughs> Yeah, that's been-, that's been uh, Could I'm you sorry. review that again real quick? Certainly, that, that was a water sewer bill appeal. Um, and that's just been tabled to next month. Um, and so we'll have information uh, to share then. Um, but um, it, it was a, basically a case of allowing attendance. 
Okay. All right. Thanks. Sure. No problem. Any other? I did go kind of quickly. Any other uh, questions? Yes, Lynn. Mark, thank you for that report. Um, on 11 Kearney Street, is there a time timeline that your board yes. is going to give the uh, the owner? Yes, 14 days. Um, and again, this was May 6th. So 14 days from the um, from that meeting's date uh, for the cleanup to happen. Um, and um, no, I'm sorry, I've got that in reverse. 14 days for um, the tenant uh, who was supposed to be moved out by May 9th to have been moved out, and then 30 days for the cleanup. And so that's 30 days from May 6th. They have to clean up the interior of the, uh, of the yeah, apartment. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of, yes, festering garbage um, that uh, for the person that is in fact a long-term tenant who um, I think there's no issue with at all, except for the fact that they're um, dealing with the smell of um, rotting. No, she, she's, she's a great tenant. Yeah, yeah. She so, is. She's... so that should hopefully um, be very close to um, fully mitigated at this point. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mark, for a very detailed report. Okay, we're next on the agenda, we have the Environmental Board, Councilmember Davies. Thanks, Mayor. The Environmental Board met last Tuesday, the 11th of uh, May. And um, just kind of a side point, they had their committees, but as I presented what we've been doing at Council and mentioned the West Street mm -hmm. Project, the uh, Environmental Board wanted me to send this along, their kind of wishes that we might in our um, reconstruction of West Street uh, think about how to adequately address pedestrian crossing at West Street and Clinton, as that's always been a problem. Anybody who knows that intersection is always challenged by trying to uh, dodge across traffic there. Uh, but with regards to their committees, they uh, had an urban forest report. They're moving along with identifying different places to put trees. And once again, ask the public that if there are spots that are located uh, that they have that might be able to contain a tree, uh, to certainly reach out to the environmental board. They have created a Facebook page and I encourage you all to join it, which they're trying to get more active with their kind of public facing um, kind of education as well as uh, letting folks know about different environmentally related events. And I believe that is just uh, on Facebook, uh, City of Oneana Environmental Board, and that will bring it right up. And you can certainly follow that and get up to date information what the Environmental Board is up to. They've also been looking at um, doing an inventory of the creeks and hills uh, in Oneonta and around Oneonta to understand a little bit more kind of the um, geographical area. And in doing so, have noted that there are quite a few creeks and quite a few hills that don't have names. And they have some uh, proposals or some ideas about perhaps uh, naming some of those hills. Um, and we'll reach, be reaching out to uh, David Merzig uh, about that particular possibility, but thought that it might be a an interesting way to involve the city and the residents and, and kind of thinking uh, about our places and maybe reflecting some of our history. Um, so they're going to be exploring that a little further, but I thought it was a very interesting discussion. And that pretty much wraps up um, what was discussed at that meeting. Any questions? Oh, Len. I'm sorry, Mark. Did you say that the link for the environmental board to their Facebook page that's going to be attached to the city website? I did not say that. Um, right, it, right now, it's the City of Oneonta uh, Environmental Board, I believe is the name of the Facebook site. So that it is, uh, if you're Googling, or if you're Googling, if you're searching on Facebook, that you can um, be able to search it in that particular way. Um, but they are trying to use that as a way to educate the public, notify the public, just create a little bit more exchange between the public, which has been lacking with the environment, the board and the greater public. Gary, is that something that maybe we could make happen is have that link off our city webpage for the environmental board so folks could go there? I don't see why not. Thanks for the suggestion, Len. Any other questions? Luke? Mark, I have to admit, I uh, just so I wouldn't forget, I just uh, found it on Facebook. It's very easy to find. So I'm just going to like. Yeah, hope you, hope you all will join it and follow it. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. 
Okay, we've got Commission on Community Relations and Human Rights, and that's Council Member Murphy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, due to a conflict in meeting schedule, we met a little bit early this month. Uh, we met on May 12th uh, at 7.15 p.m. Um, we discussed a few things at the meeting. We discussed uh, the Trailblazer Blazer Award, which we've talked about uh, in the past, and specifics on location are forthcoming as things are opening up. Um, we're trying to, or the, the board is trying to organize that in the best way possible. Um, the board is hoping to uh, have a Juneteenth celebration at Neowa Park on uh, June 19th from three to eight. Uh, it will be open to the public from three to five will be family hour. Uh, from five to 7.30 will be uh, the main event. And uh, the last 30 minutes will be about an informal parting of ways. Um, and uh, Deandres, uh, Deandra Singetti Daniels, who's on the um, uh, board is working on a website, which is uh, forthcoming. Um, as well as uh, our inclusivity statement is on its final round of review. And I believe that was that was our meeting. Do you have any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, um, I will just give uh, folks a little um, peek into the future in that um, we're working to have the presentation of the Trailblazer Award. And you all rec will recall those rewards that are given to women who have shown leadership here in the city of Oneonta. For the past two years, we did not have last year's because of COVID and we're late on this year's. So, and we have um, four very, very, very special women who uh, are, rece are receiving these awards. We want to make sure that we give them the proper uh, recognition and in a presentation. So we are looking to have it before an Outlaws game at the Maskey Field this year. Uh, it'll be a nice way to do it uh, in an outdoor setting, uh, have more people involved, feel safe, uh, and um, even enjoy a hot dog. So, um, uh, so more details on that to come. Thank you, Mayor. I, I had. I uh, wrote that down, but I forgot how how uh, we're in the process of that. So thank you. Okay, uh, we can go to committee reports. Legislative committee, council member Rafter. You're you're muted, John. You know how did it how did it happen that the most common sentence uh, in the country this past year is you're on mute. That's something we never even heard before. <laughs> well, hopefully that'll be falling out of the vocabulary a bit. Uh, in any case, uh, we did meet on uh, May 10. Uh, on the agenda tonight is consideration of uh, bees and chickens ordinance uh, that was developed and a very attractive uh, new format for uh, our zoning code. Uh, so that'll be uh, in consideration this evening. Uh, also, uh, there's going to be, I think, a mask and face coverings. Uh, it seems to be a moving target. Perhaps we'll know more about that when we discuss that. And uh, the last thing that we discussed was the, um, the uh, MU1 form-based code that has been developed by Steve Yearly. Again, very attractive document and uh, a lengthy document, a hundred and some pages. So uh, that I believe has been distributed uh, to everyone on the council and uh, encourage folks to read that. And we'll be taking that up at the uh, legislation committee and uh, people might wanna tune into that meeting, uh, raise some questions when there's time, uh, if, if it's there. There's a lot, lot there in, uh, to read. And so we should have some good luck with it. Um, and that's essentially it. John, I'm going to remove the two ordinance motions, the mask ordinance and the B ordinance uh, from the consent agenda. Um, and uh, we'll have them as separate agendas so that uh, we can uh, discuss more information about them. It's of something of interest, uh, obviously, to people um, in the public. So given an opportunity to be aired better. Thank you, perfectly fine. If there are no questions, 
We'll go on to the Finance and Human Resource, Resources Committee, Council Member Carson. Thank you, Gary. Uh, we also met Monday, May 10th. I believe we had 11 or 12 uh, items on our agenda. Um, Finance Director Ginny Lee has provided the minutes. So I guess, um, did everybody have an opportunity to take a look at the minutes? And was there any questions from that? If not, I just would like to bring uh, your eyes and attention to motion 10 tonight on the agenda with regards to the West Street reconstruction. Um, we will be considering once we approve this, if we approve this uh, project, that we will need to bond for $2.2 million. So I just want to highlight that along with, I just also want to thank our leadership through the personnel director and our acting fire chief and handling motion number 14 and cleaning up some of the grievances that were left behind by the previous administration. So I want to thank those two individuals for coming and along with uh, the union leadership for coming to some resolution that I think uh, will work well for all parties involved. Any questions? <clears throat> Dave Risberger? Yeah, Len, on uh, motion number 10, uh, the West Street reconstruction, uh, um, I figured I could bring it up now or bring it up later, but sure. uh, what is, do we have a timeline on this if this is approved tonight? Well, if our constituents have their way and I have my way, it'll be done tomorrow, but um, I believe it's a multi month project and according to my notes i don't have a timeline greg could you help me out here yeah sure uh the project contract will have 150 day duration so if we award um say we have a notice to proceed around june 1st which i would expect we'd have it by then uh, we can expect completion by the end of october this year do we have uh, contingency plans for um traffic going up that way once um, the college is back in session? Yeah, there'll be a detour along Church Street through the duration of the project while the work is ongoing. Okay. All right, thanks. Yep. If there are no further questions, thank you, Len. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> and we'll move along. Okay, I have a, I just have a bunch of good things to report tonight that are happening. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, New York State Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul was here today. Uh, she came to check on our DRI. She wanted to uh, get a walking tour and find out how our DRI was progressing. Uh, we took a look at the some of the um, signs and facades that are showing up for our downtown improvement fund. I already mentioned, we talked about the Springbrook project on the Ford Block building of which she was um, very excited about. Uh, we took a look at the um, construction going on at, for the lofts on Deed Street and the Grain Innovation Center. Uh, to another thing she was um, very enthusiastic uh, to see. It's the type of project that um, is really making a difference in downtowns that are um, being renovated, revitalized. And we talked about the uh, demolition of the building that is causing blight on Market Street, which we should see this fall, as well as uh, development of a transit hub downtown, renovation of the parking garage, and a just a whole new life, um, new vibrant life uh, to Market Street. Um, without a doubt, the Lieutenant Governor walked away very impressed with the progress uh, that the city of Oneonta is making and comment a number of times of how much she loves Oneonta's downtown and loves coming to visit here because it is such a special downtown. Uh, she did have to attend while she was here a Zoom meeting. So she asked if there was a place where she could um, <clears throat> sit to hold her meeting. What better place would there be than the ribbon cutting just took place a couple of days ago, Downtown Works, which if you don't know, is a co-work location new to the city of Oneonta, opened by Peter Clark. It's a share workplace, work where you can rent an office building. It's absolutely beautiful if you get a chance to go in there. Um, it, Peter has done just a magnificent job 
on that. Uh, he's got one or two tenants in there already. And um, Lieutenant Governor was one of his first um, customers uh, to use one of those offices for her Zoom meeting today. Um, I called Peter early this morning and I said, uh, please let me know how you access the Wi Fi. And Peter said, oh, yeah, you know, um, we got Wi Fi, but I think it's just in the air. I said, Peter, that's the definition of Wi Fi. We know that. I need a password. He got me the password. So Peter's doing a great job there. Um, another great thing already, I think it was mentioned a little before the meeting was the NICA, at, that is the National Interscholastic Cycling Association bike race. They came back for the second time. They were here two years ago. They were here this weekend. It was a two day event. Normally it's a one day event, but because of COVID and have less people on site at, at a time, they broke it up into two days. Uh, middle school on Saturdays, uh, high school on Sunday. Um, I was honored to be asked to do the start for the race, um, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but the best part about it was uh, all of the people who came, they came from all over the state, the western part of the state, Long Island, um, uh, just how positive they were, how enthusiastic they were, and how much they love coming to Oneonta for their races for a number of reasons. And they want to just keep coming back every year. For um, one, they love our trails. Uh, you know, the trails are challenging. Uh, they talk about the switchbacks going up the mountain there, uh, the downhills. Um, they're high quality, well-maintained, challenging trails. Uh, they talk about the access to it, the easy access to it, and the setup that they have on the high school grounds there that they're able to use. And they talk about what a lovely community Oneonta is and how welcoming uh, this community has been in bringing them here and hosting their races here and how much we appreciate them being here. So uh, truly a win, win, win. Um, and uh, a big thank you to everybody who's involved in that. And one of the people who's um, involved in it is um, Mike Mabin, who is the coach for the Otsego County team. They're called the Otsego uh, Composite. And I, I think that probably references the material that some of the bike frames are made out of, I'm guessing. But um, uh, he has been a big organizer of that and a big advocate, uh, advocate of bringing the race to Oneonta. And um, it, it's just great stuff. And I learned that um, our very own Mark Davies is a legend in his time when it comes to mountain biking, because I heard a lot of people talk about uh, Mark Davies as being almost Olympic status when it comes to bike racing. So uh, who knew, Mark? Uh, we knew you bike raced, but we didn't know you were a legend. Uh, I think they're talking about somebody else. <laughs> um, other good things happening. We will have a Memorial Day parade um, this year. And um, David Hayes is organizing it. And we know that David loves parades. Um, we will have some form of a 4th of July uh, event in the park. It won't be the typical large 4th of July event with 10,000 people, uh, but it will at least admit, uh, have a couple of concerts and details to be worked out. Already mentioned by uh, Councilmember Murphy, there'll be a Juneteenth um, event uh, this year in the park. Uh, and um, I think we'll be talking about it uh, later this evening. Uh, we are planning on 12 street closings on Saturdays for um, outdoor dining, uh, just as we did last um, year. So that will be back by popular demand. So all many, many, many good things that are happening. Um, also, I wanna thank um, Mark Drenick, who has taken the lead along with um, uh, Len Carson, uh, Dave Risberger, Luke Murphy, who are developing an implementation plan for the police reform initiative. Uh, I believe that that I, am, I spoke with uh, Mark Drenick about it earlier today. Um, it looks like that that will be ready to um, 
go out to the public and the council by the end of the first week in June uh, to be um, voted on by the council on the second meeting in June. And um, the uh, also uh, before the council votes on it, we will open it up to the public to speak uh, at that meeting so that the council can hear any comments from the public um, about the implementation plan before they vote on it. And so that's all I've got, but it's a lot, a lot of good things happening. Okay, I'm gonna now go to the consent agenda and my screen goes to sleep if I talk too long. Okay, <clears throat> consent agenda, I'll read through and then ask for um, if you want any items removed. Motion one is motion now that the council approves the minutes of the regular meeting, which was held on May 4th, 2021. Motion two, that the council approves the warrants, totaling $662,284.29. And that the same be placed on the director of finances desk for payment as presented. Three, Motion of the council approves the application for benefits under general municipal law 207A for employee 024219, dated January 13, 2021, pursuant to the negotiated terms of the collective bargaining agreement between the city and the Oneonta Professional Firefighters Local 2408. Four, motion that the council accepts and authorizes the U.S. Department of Transportation Federal Aviation Administration grant in the amount of $67,000, requiring no local match for the Airport Improvement Program project number 336-0092-023-2020. At the Albert S. Nader Regional Airport. This is to conduct an airport pavement management program and authorizes the mayor to sign any and all agreements for the project and also authorizes and creates a capital project budget for said project. Five, motion that the council approves the purchasing agent's recommendation to award the bid for a four-wheel drive 2022 Chevrolet Tahoe model LS to the lowest responsive qualified bidder who met the specifications of the bid. And that was Capolino Chevrolet of Boston, from Boston, New York. I don't think there is a Boston, New York that I know of, is there? There is? There's a Boston? I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Where is it, Jenny? It's at towards Buffalo. Okay. And do they pronounce it Boston? Because I know in New York, they always change the, the pronunciation of names if they're copying somebody else's name. But it's Boston, right? Okay. With a bid amount of $42,893.05, contingent upon the New York State DOT's approval. Six. Motion that the council authorizes the mayor to enter into an agreement with the Oneonta Family YMCA to provide summer recreation aquatics services for costs up to $70,100 with the option to amend the contract for extended services and further authorizes a waiver from provisions of the city's purchasing policies and procedure manual relative to professional services. This agreement is subject to approval of the city attorney. Seven, motion of the council approves the release of the original authorized, authorized commitment of the excess funds from the completed capital projects and return or transfer said funds, including reserving excess bond proceeds for future debt payments as indicated on the attached report. Eight, 
Motion to establish the 2021 Streets Project Capital Projects, which will be funded by a combination of funds provided from state funding and remaining balances within various street capital projects. And to authorize the estimated project budgets and capital budget amendments and transfers as follows. Somebody's revving motorcycles outside. I hope you don't hear them. The um, $184,788 is coming from the capital projects balances, and $250,000 will be coming from New York State aid from CHIPS, Dave New York. And EWR, I believe, is emergency weather. Greg, what's the R? Or winter weather? What is EWR, Greg? Sorry. Um Extreme winter recovery. Okay. I was close. <laughs> Nine. Motion to approve the budget transfer amendments totaling $40,451 as presented. Per the attached reports, 10 motion as a result of competitive bids being solicited and accepted for the Western Reconstruction Capital Project. The council approves the purchasing agent's recommendation to award the bid to the responsive qualified bidder, which is R.B. Robinson Contracting Incorporated of Candor, New York, in the amount of $1,898,995. And the council further authorizes the creation of the capital project budget, including engineering costs as follows. And that is 112,000 goes to engineering, 924,600 to street reconstruction, $489,240 to sanitary sewers, $674,160 to transmission and distribution for a total of $2,200,000, all to be funded through serial bonds. And the provisions of this motion are contingent upon the council approving a bond resolution funding for this project. 11, motion as a result of competitive bids being solicited and accepted for the Catella Well Raw Water Transmission Main Replacement Project. The council approves the purchasing agent's recommendation to award the base bid to the lowest responsive qualified bidder, which is Bellamy Construction Incorporated of Scotia, New York, in the amount of $334,500. Okay, um, 12 and 13, I said I would remove from the consent agenda. 14 uh, and 15 are not on the consent agenda. They'll be separate for discussion as well. So um, do I have any requests to remove any of the 11 items that are on the consent agenda? I see none. So I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Council member Rafter, second by council member Drenick. Would the clerk please take the vote? Call the vote. Council Member Murphy. Aye. Council Member Davies. Aye. Council Member Risberger. Aye. Council Member Lapari Shu. Aye. Council Member Carson. Aye. Council Member Harrington. Yes. Council Member Raptor. Aye. Council Member Drennick. Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you. So we will go to motion number 12. We don't have Stephen Yearly here tonight, do we? Okay. Um, motion 12 is that the council adopts the ordinance to amend chapter 68 of the code of the city of Oneonta entitled <clears throat> Animals, which was laid electronically on the desk of the common council on May 4th, 2021, it would amend certain provisions of the code of the city of Oneonta as they relate to bees and fowl. At least it's not to birds and bees. Um, Dave Risberger, do you want to give a brief, or not Dave Risberger, um, we'll 
go to um, John Rafter because uh, it just came in a legislative committee. Do you want to give a brief um, summary of what this ordinance proposes to permit? Well, the uh, essentially it, it um, approves uh, a new a new approval to um, have beekeeping allowed inside the city of Oneonta. Um, I think that the um, the out, the ordinance that we, as we've received it um, outlines very very well what uh, Stephen came up with, uh, along with uh, input from David Merzig uh, from uh, surveys and inquiries of other cities that have beekeeping ordinances. Uh, also, I think there's a, uh, a bit of a revision and certainly a lot of uh, illustration about uh, the, um, what's the other species we're talking about here? <laughs> Chickens. Ow. Chickens, the fowls. And uh, I think it's specifically chickens. I don't know if ducks and um, parakeets, et cetera, are, are included in this, but, uh, but I do think, again, it, it uh, does a very nice job of illustrating what's required to have an approved um, beekeeping or um, chicken keeping. So that's essentially it. It's, uh, the new thing is the bee ordinance that came out of the, uh, the environmental committee some uh, months ago and has been worked on since. So I want to thank Stephen for coming up with that. And I'm hey, impressed with the new format. Uh, Stephen just joined us. So um, Stephen, you want to, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so John pretty much summed it up. That to, to clarify, there, there is no uh, change in the foul that is allowed. It's just, um, there's some slight changes to the type of, um, facilities that are used to keep chickens. It also uh, implements a um, inspection of chicken coops and beehives to ensure that, that the actual um, people keeping these things are actually following the code. So it, it kind of sets up, I mean, it's kind of like a, a fowl and bee uh, <laughs> rental inspection, if you will. So kind of like the landlords have to get a CFC, we would be incorporating like a, a uh, an inspection process to the chicken and beehives. Um, but yeah, other than that, I, I kind of changed the format so that um, it's a little more uh, graphical. So it kind of shows what, um, you know, it kind of provides like a, a little better, like a picture of kind of how these things are laid out. And if you look at the end of the document, there's also a resources section that includes uh, contacts for local beekeeping associations, uh, there's a couple links to Cornell who has a um, fairly robust uh, like urban agriculture and like um, beekeeping and like chicken uh, community. So it kind of incorporated a lot of the things that we kind of discussed in the legislative meeting. So um, yeah, so I, I think it came out pretty good. Stephen, could you just, um, just very briefly um, rattle off some of the uh, precautionary things that are included as requirements for keeping bees under this ordinance? Yeah, I mean, so we, we would be requiring a, an inspection. We would be requiring a, a permitting process. Um, the hives would be set back from property lines. There's a um, requirement for a flyaway barrier, which basically encourages bees to uh, fly above uh, body height. Um, there's a restriction as to how the proximity of a bee, a beehive to neighboring water bodies like swimming pools and uh, neighboring like dog runs, like kenneled areas for animals. Um, there's also setback requirements from property lines and adjoining structures. And there's a requirement that that comb related to bees uh, is not left on the property because it could encourage swarming. So, I mean, there's, I, I don't want to say it's, it's, it's a uh, boilerplate stuff, but, but Pennsylvania has a pretty robust uh, state bee law that a lot of this was drawn off of. And uh, the city of Buffalo actually did a really nice job of kind of uh, incorporating the Pennsylvania bee law into their local ordinance. So a lot of this is mirrored off of what other large, you know, urban areas that are, you know, frankly, they're, they're more dense than Oneonta uh, are already doing. Um, I contacted New York City. They kind of provided me with some 
uh, some bee related uh, guidance because they allow urban beekeeping. Um, so yeah, so I mean, th this, this ordinance is drawing off of a lot of kind of best practices that are going on right now in uh, urban beekeeping land. Thank you very much, Stephen. I don't think, um, I don't think I had a, uh, did I have a motion and a second? I don't think so. So I think I'll entertain a motion to approve. Councilmember Murphy, a second by Councilmember Davies. Discussion. Mark Jonick. I just want to um, say that this is one of the most clear, uh, precise, um, and um, well illustrated uh, and helpful. Um, documents that I've seen in a very long time. And, and I tell you, I think it's going to be a huge help to anybody who's inclined to keep chickens or keep bees. Um, so I just want to, I just want to say, Stephen, this is really good work. Luke Murphy. I also wanted to speak about this um, and, and thank Stephen uh, for his time. Um, this went through many, many, many iterations and legislative committee. Um, and I think it's going to be great. I think it's great for the people of Oneonta. I also think um, environmentally, Oneonta will benefit from this. Bees are phenomenal for the environment. Uh, and I think it's great that Oneonta is doing its part. Mark Davies. Yeah, I'd like to just also point out um, that this whole idea um, at least kind of launched through, you know, Stephen may have, I think he had some ideas about this, but this initially started um, a member of the community came to an environmental board meeting and, and talked about, had just gone through a bee um, keeping training course and was really very excited about bees and, and really wanted to make sure that um, the environmental board kind of put this in their agenda and began working on this. And this was the, I think this was the last environmental board meeting <coughs> in person prior to COVID. So it's been a while and I think there's a lot of really great work from, from Stephen. Um, and I just, I kind of appreciated seeing this start from a, a you know, a petitioner at the environment, the board meeting, bringing this up and, and having it all the way brought here, forward here. I think it's kind of grassroots democracy, local democracy in action. It's kind of cool to see it. Okay. If there's no further discussion, oh, I'm sorry, David Merzik. I, I also want to give a shout out to both the, uh, well, Stephen, for, for putting that statute together in the graphic form that they did and also to carry, because I couldn't figure out how the heck we were going to get all that stuff into one of our statute books uh, in, in the way that, was, that it was presented. But uh, she went to General Publishing, who handles our codes, and they said, oh, no problem. Welcome to the 21st century. We can do this. So I, um, so I want to I thank everybody for Getting, getting me up to speed so that in fact we can have uh, statutes like this uh, both in this case and also in the future. And I think it's, it's a great way to provide real documentation as opposed to arcane legalese as to how we can get something done and to how to let people who are looking at statutes know how to do things. So I, I appreciate Carrie's help in this as well. Okay, so um, with that, um, we will now um, go to the vote on whether to be or not to be. Carrie, would you please call the vote? I don't know how I can follow that line. Council Try. Member Murphy? Aye. Council Member Davies? Aye. Council Member Risberger? Aye. Council Member Lapari Shu? Aye. Council Member Carson? Aye. Council Member Harrington? Yes. Council Member Rafter? Yes. Council Member Dranick? Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, oh, Diane Jorgensen, I owe you an apology. For some reason, your report was not on the agenda. So um, after we finish the consent agenda, I'll call it on you to do your report. So I'm sorry about that. You're right in the middle of my screen, too. So. Okay, we'll go to motion 13. <clears throat> motion that the council adopts the ordinance to amend chapter 122 of this code of the city of Oneonta entitled masks and face coverings, which was laid electronically on the desk of the common council on May 11, 2021, and would amend certain provisions of the code of the city of Oneonta as they pertain to the use of masks 
and her face coverings in the city. Um, let me just uh, briefly um, just say a few words on this, um, try and simplify it. Uh, we're currently living in a very confusing time uh, with things changing rapidly and um, CDC coming out with recommendations which are not binding, but then the states, you know, uh, following suit. The, um, the whole issue of, well, the CDC recommends that people who have been vaccinated don't need to wear masks. Uh, they don't deal with the how in the world do municipalities enforce that because no municipality wants to uh, be stopping people on the street to ask them to show proof of whether they've been vaccinated or not. So in essence, the way this ordinance stands now is that it would remove the current mask ordinance that we have requiring people in our downtown district to um, wear masks when they're in the public areas outdoors. Uh, it would, however, um, continue to give the city the right to require masks at major downtown public events. That would be the Memorial Day Parade. That would mean the street closures. It would mean any customers we have downtown. So um, the thought is that uh, some people um, may not feel ready yet to attend events without people wearing masks. So this would um, uh, allow us to keep doing so. We also don't know where things are going, how fast things are changing, what direction things will be changing. But this would also allow us to, whether it's in two weeks from now or two months from now or four months from now, uh, change the ordinance once again to remove the requirement that masks are required uh, in special events. So as it stands now, it's to say no mask ordinance in downtown. Uh, however, the city would still require all people to wear masks if they're attending uh, special events in summary. So I'll entertain a motion to approve. Council member um, Lavari Shu, a second by council member Rafter, discussion. Okay, I see none, so, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Len Carson. Thank you, Gary. Um, <clears throat> so David, maybe you can help me out on this. How do we adapt from this new ordinance to the state changing their, their thoughts, their, their regulations on what they want the municipalities to govern? The only, the only way um, that, that the statute is written as amended, assuming it passes tonight, uh, would be if the uh, governor or withdrew the emergency provision. The emergency provision withdrawal is still in here. Uh, so if there was a, if the governor terminated the emergency um, limitations, then uh, then then it would then it would change automatically. But other than that, you would still have to make an amendment to the statute. Is that the question you're asking? It is. Thank you for clarification on that. Thank you, Gary. Any, Council Member Rafter? Yeah, just uh, to, if someone could speak uh, to the, uh, the rights of uh, houses of worship, stores, et cetera, to uh, have a mask mandate, so to speak, or uh, for entering and uh, doing business in their space. Um, my understanding <clears throat> from the um, recent issuance from the governor was that uh, stores may choose, businesses of any type um, may choose to continue to require masks inside their premises. Um, as to churches, I did not see that mentioned in the ordinance. So I'm going to assume that, um, I don't know what to assume. David, do you have any idea? It's my understanding that they that they have the same rights uh, as as other businesses. They have the right to require them. So, um, in essence, um, we're not part of that. Yes. Um, the businesses can 
um, monitor themselves as they see fit, but however, they do have the authority to require masks if they choose to do so. Scott Harrington. I guess my question is, how is this gonna affect the street closure on Saturdays for the businesses with food and stuff? I'm assuming they, we, we wouldn't be required, they would still have to wear the mask if they're out walking, even outside, but if they sit down and eat, then they wouldn't have to have them on. Do I understand that correct? That's correct. Okay. Mark Johnny. And the, uh, the, I think we've got two dozen signs. Uh, I presume they'll be coming down shortly. Now keep in mind, um, this will not take effect. If this, is, if the, if this passes tonight, um, it will not take effect for two weeks because again, this is an ordinance, which means it has to go through a public hearing before I can sign it. Which, Gary, it potentially means that it could get changed again because the governor could be coming out with another change on it, right? Uh, we live in interesting times. <laughs> Good answer. Um, but back to what Scott was just asking, though, I thought the number was 500. So if there's not 500 in a concentrated area, then this doesn't apply. I thought that that um, was the recommendation from the governor was the number 500. Um, our provision in this ordinance um, doesn't relate to gatherings. See, what, here's where it gets confusing. Um, all of the, most of the regulations that talk about 500 talk about gatherings. Gatherings are, are places where you can control the number of people that enter. So for example, uh, if there's a wedding, if there's a concert, um, you control and know how many people will enter. When you do a public event, um, numbers don't mean a thing because people can come in. You can't, we don't restrict people from walking down the street. They can come from any direction. You never know how many people are going to be there. So um, our ordinance uh, requires masks during a special public event because um, we have no control over how many people will show up. Okay. Scott Harrington? Just, just for an example for people that might be watching later that want to know. So like, say we had a 4th of July parade. That's why we're doing this ordinance is because we can't control how many people are going to be on Main Street to watch that parade come down through. Correct. That's okay. exactly correct. And we will be having a Memorial Day parade. And, we, and that's a very good um, Point, Scott, because we don't know whether for the Memorial Day Parade, people will be shoulder to shoulder on the sidewalk or the number of people that show up will be spread six feet apart. There's no further discussion. Um, would the clerk please call the vote on this? Council Member Murphy. Aye. Council Member Davies. Aye. Council Member Risberger? Aye. Council Member Lapari Shu? Aye. Council Member Carson? Yes. Council Member Harrington? Aye. Council Member Rafter? Aye. Council Member Drenick? Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. We now go to um, <clears throat> motion 14, motion that the council authorizes the mayor to execute a memorandum of agreement between the city and the Oneonta Professional Firefighters Local 2408. This is to settle a November 25th, 2020 grievance and resultant arbitration demand pertaining to an alleged violation of collective bargaining agreement, Article 21. I'll entertain a motion to approve. Councilman Carson, uh, second Councilmember Davies, discussion. If there is none, please call the vote, Gary. Council Member Murphy? Aye. Council Member Davies? Aye. Council Member Risperger? Aye. Council Member Lapari Shu? Aye. Council Member Carson? Aye. Council Member Harrington? Yes. Council Member Rafter? Yes. Council Member Drenick? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you.
And motion 15 is motion of the council approves the Otsego Pride Alliances Parade permit for an event to occur on Main Street on June 5th, 2021 with a modification that the request for a full street clo closure is denied, but traffic control from the Oneonta Police Department will be provided, which will allow for the Drive with Pride car parade to occur on Main Street from Neo, Neo uh, Place to South Main Street. And um, Carrie, do you want to give a little description of what this drive with pride will look like? Sure, so in lieu of having an actual event in Ewa Park, which the organizers were concerned they could not address the number of people and who may attend, uh, they've opted to have a car parade. So the vehicles will meet in Ewa Park. They'll exit Ewa Park via Ewa Place onto Main Street. Uh, they'll have traffic control from the Oneana Police Department, which will bring them down Main Street to the South Main Street intersection and they'll return to the park via South Main and Market. They're looking for a half hour's worth of assistance from the city. Okay, so um, we'll hold off on discussion and questions. What I'll do is first uh, get a motion, entertain a motion to approve. Councilmember Harrington, second by Councilmember Lapari Shu. Now discussion. Katie Lapari Shu. Thanks, Mayor. I just had a question because I noticed on their application that they had also requested to have the street closed. And I saw in the motion that that is um, denied. And so I just wondered the thought behind that and the information will be helpful. Sure. So the idea was to keep it simple, A, because a half hour street closure of Main Street uh, was more feasible. Uh, full street closure by DPW was not. Uh, there are some OPD resource limitations that they were concerned with. There's also the short notice of the request. Um, there's also an interesting note that found out Main Street from Chestnut Street to the river is actually a DOT right away. And we cannot technically close it without coordinating with them. So there are some time constraints there as well. So this was gotcha. a way to allow the event to take place in a different manner. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, if there is none, would the clerk please call the vote? Councilmember Murphy? Aye. Councilmember Davies? Aye. Councilmember Risberger? Aye. Councilmember Lapari Shu? Aye. Councilmember Carson? Aye. Councilmember Harrington? Yes. Councilmember Rafter? Yes. Councilmember Drenick? Aye. Motion passes, thank you. Okay, uh, any um, additional business or discussion items from any council members, uh, Katie Lepore issue? Well, um, not to hold Dr. Dr. Jensen back any longer, but I was actually hoping that we could get um, just a quick update in this forum from the CABRC on how things are going. I know those meetings are, um, you know, recorded and viewable on YouTube, but just a summary would be great. Uh, sure. We'll ask okay. Council Member Drenick to provide that. Thank you. Um, by my account, we probably have um, three more meetings uh, to get where we need to get. We have been, uh, we, we broke all of the recommendations into two piles um, that, that we could address ourselves as a committee with the input of um, the personnel director and the uh, acting chief and another pile that required what we determined uh, would require legal opinion. Uh, we've uh, gotten those legal opinions, generally speaking, from uh, three sources. And um, we are now at the point where I think we've got two or three recommendations that are not fully um, wordsmithed uh, to the point where we can include them uh, comfortably in a package for the council. So we have that little bit of work. And then at that point, uh, we'll be looking at the um, timelines and the um, there's an appendix that provides um, various options uh, that we'll present to council in some format um, for council to make some determinations. Uh, we're going to provide the council with as complete a document as is possible. Um, 
and um, we do expect that there will be a couple of um, items that the council will want to weigh in on uh, via discussion and we'll um, probably uh, keep those in a, a separate um, essentially container from um, that full um, um, that, that full document that uh, again, I think uh, three meetings from now, we should be pretty much where we need to be. Uh, there are a couple of um, questions that we weren't able to resolve unanimously uh, as a committee and we'll be bringing in some opinions on both sides of the issues to um, educate us um, more fully. And then with that, we will um, we'll hopefully be able to arrive at a determination of what goes in or not into the, the final uh, into the final package, but we've been working hard, um, and um, and I'm very it's a, it's a it's it's been a lot of work, but uh, I, we're all I think pretty proud of the product. Okay, S Scott Harrington. I just have two questions that were brought up to me, and I told them I'd ask tonight because they were asked to me a couple uh, a little while ago. One, um, there were say a uh, question is now that some things are starting to be relaxed with with uh, CDC and, and New York State with the executive orders and stuff, has any thought been given to reopening City Hall to our regular hours? And the second question that was asked to me is, when can they expect us to go back to face-to-face -face meetings? Um, good question, uh, Scott. As a matter of fact, um, I have asked to meet uh, with the key city staff um, later this week to discuss those very issues, to find out. Um, personally, I think we're, um, we're getting close to the point where we can do both of those. Um, I just want to meet with the key city staff to find out any concerns that they may have uh, before going forward with it. Thank you very much. Council Member, Council Member Murphy. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I, I just wanted to let everybody know about um, an electric vehicle car show that's coming up. Um, it's free and open to the public. It'll be at Damaski Field on Saturday, uh, May 20th, well, this Saturday uh, from 10 to 2. Um, if for anybody that's interested in um, what it's like to own an electric car, uh, what they're all about, where you can charge them, any anything, uh, it'll be from 10 to 2 uh, at Damaski Fields this Saturday. Okay, um, Dave Risberger had his hand up. Yes, um, thank you. Um, Gary, you and I had been in touch a little bit um, over the last week or so. Uh, recently, I was notified by quite a few people in my ward that they received notices about their leaf bags um, being put out at the wrong time. And basically what happened was we had good weather and so people started to go out and do their, either cut their lawn or take up uh, trim, trim hedges or whatnot, fill bags and put them by the side of the road. Um, in some cases, it was, uh, the bags were left on their own property, um, not even on the median. And they were given these notices asking them not to put them out. Um, I don't think, I brought this up, but nothing seemed to have been decided solidly on what we're doing going forward. But there's a number of people in my ward that don't have garages, they don't have carports, there's no place that they can put these bags to keep them out of the weather. And um, I, we, we can't, I don't think it's right, I don't think it's right or, or uh, uh, fair that we would expect people to do their um, clean up of their lawn based on what the weather report is going to be and what if that doesn't match up with when their pickup is for every two weeks. Um, the interesting thing is I noticed that the first pickup that we had from my ward, um, it was actually raining for a couple days leading up to the cleanup. So all the bags that people put out were soaking wet anyway. Um, so I understand that um, DPW was concerned that bags would be out there too long and they would break when they would pick them up. But um, I, I, whatever we decide, I think putting out notices for people that are just trying to keep their property clean, which is what we want people to do in the city, I think it just seemed more of a punishment than anything. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, 
Greg, do you want to, um, I don't want to put you on the spot right here, but do you want to, I mean, this is an issue that probably needs a little um, more looking into on how we can do it best. Uh, do you want to take a little time to address this with a plan um, or do you feel ready to do so now? I don't want to put you on the spot right here, but. That's okay. Um, I don't, I don't mind talking a little bit about it, but I, I do think it would be best if we put a little thought into it and had a discussion at the next planning committee meeting, which I think is coming right up. Um, if, if you agree with that approach, Dave and, and Gary. Sounds good. That sounds good to me. Just in general, I mean, obviously those, maybe, maybe it wasn't obvious, but those notices weren't intended to be punitive in any way. It was just trying to get the message out as to what the program is. Um, over the years since I've been here, it's been a decade, we've had different approaches to, to, to bag and brush pickup. At one point it was, you can call in as a resident and schedule a pickup. Um, other times it was just uh, deep that we would go around whenever we found time and, and pick things up. And it was very inefficient. Um, not a good use of our best use of our resources. So putting the schedule in place was intended to to just use our resources as widely as we could. Um, and, and the notices were just intended to try to get as many people as possible to follow along with that. But we understand that there are concerns and we could certainly discuss that some more. So we'll have to And also if there's some way we can come up with a way of having that part of the dump open on a Saturday, uh, lots of people would rather just take their stuff down there on their own, but they can't during the week. And I know we've talked about this before, and there's a lot of, of hoops that we would have to jump through to actually make that happen. Um, but hopefully we can come up with some solution. So we'll put it on the agenda for the next planning committee meeting. I think that's a great idea. Sounds good. Um, Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I would, I think that the calling to have your bags picked up probably went out with dial a bus, so. Okay, uh, I think it was Mark Drennick had his hands up. Or did you have your hands up, Mark? Yes, I did, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, Diane. I feel like you're, you're waiting and waiting, um, but I just wanna get um, this out too. I want, first of all, I wanna thank DPW for their um, assistance uh, with the senior send off on uh, Saturday, it was a, it was everything we could have hoped that it would be, but I, I want to uh, just share this one piece with you. The um, the council approved uh, funding and Destination Oneonta was wonderful in stepping up and helping to facilitate all of that um, coming into um, coming to place. But we, um, I had been um, parked on um, Main Street in front of the Westcott lot as you walk up from the Westcott lot. The banner uh, that you've seen, I'm sure everybody has. Um, uh, was just put up on, across Main Street a few hours earlier. Uh, I just happened to be, you know, messing around with my phone and I'm watching uh, student after student after student uh, coming up the steps from the Westcott lot up to Main Street and every single one of them, and I'm not kidding, every single one of them did this and took pictures of the banner. Uh, it was you know, uh, it was money very well spent. We have this banner for years now uh, to come. And, uh, and I just wanna thank everybody. Um, I wish I could have had you all uh, somehow in the car with me to, to see the reaction of the students to it. It, it really uh, was pretty great. So thank you. Okay, Len, did you have your hand up? I did, I did Gary, thank you. I just wanted to um, also piggyback on what Scott brought up with regards to meeting live in our council meetings is that we um, continue digitally recording our meetings. I think it's been extremely helpful and I'd like to see us do it. I think we kind of all weighed in on that before. I felt like the majority said we didn't want to have an individual camera up in our face, but at least having one recording the group, that would be great. Yeah, and, and that is underway. Um, uh, on Mark Drennick's leadership on it. The um, uh, Greg Carey have been working with a local uh, IT um, uh, vendor to uh, install a professional camera uh, that um, will have a zoom capability and swivel capability. Uh, so, uh, and that it will also be interactive through zoom uh, council can watch it on the big screens and uh, if the public uh, can still participate um, through Zoom with the council if they don't attend, 
And um, as long as it's permitted, I don't know how much longer it will be permitted, but as long as it's permitted, uh, even if a council member is not comfortable attending, they could participate um, by uh, Zoom through the system, um, as long as that is permitted by the state. So that is under, and that, um, that will um, happen before we start in-person meetings. Was there anybody I missed except for Dr. Jorgensen? Well, thank you for having me back. And hopefully I'll be brief and mostly the bearer of good news. Um, but I think as we all appreciate, we're clearly in a time of transition. And what I say tonight may not be the case tomorrow. So um, it's been four weeks since Wait a minute here, is this right? Yeah, four weeks since um, I reported to you and um, globally we're now at over 163 million cases. That's about 20 million more than four weeks ago. But you can see the trend is finally starting to come down. What drove a lot of the increase in the last month as you're aware was um, a big outbreak in India which is now the second most uh, that has now the second most cases in the world. Um, Brazil still has a significant uh, rate of transmission and you can see the United States were coming down as are most uh, countries in Europe. Finally, we're trending down consistently in the United States, both in terms of cases as well as hospitalizations and deaths. Um, averaging yesterday 32,000 cases, still some and still about where we were maybe last fall. 37% um, of United States individuals have been fully vaccinated and just being mindful of this data because sometimes it's um, of all um, people and sometimes it's referring to just the adult population. Um, if you're just referring to the adult population, 43% of, um, oh wait, let me get back. That's New York State, sorry. 43% of New York State um, residents are fully vaccinated and, and that's different than what, doc, what um, the governor reported yesterday was 52%. The difference being that 52% um, is the adult population, those over 18%. So again, just to be mindful of sometimes those numbers seem different. And the reason is your denominator in some cases is different. Here it's all persons. 43% um, of all New Yorkers are now fully vaccinated. And here a sharp decline in cases in New York state, which is quite reassuring as well as um, hospitalizations and deaths going down. Um, Mohawk Valley, we're now at a 1.1% positivity. When I last reported to you four weeks ago, that was 1.9%. So clearly a decline. Also cases, seven day average per 100,000 is now just under 10. We were at 31 four weeks ago. Um, this just shows us somewhat graphically, uh, this being our cases per 100,000 gradually declining. Again, it, I mean, we're still, we still have some community transmission. We're higher than we were uh, last summer, but uh, trending downward. Um, here you also see at Seago County trending downward. Today's report had only three cases. So really, really reassuring data there continuing to have two hospitalized people and 25 active cases. Um, since my last report to you four weeks ago, there have been three deaths um, and our surrounding counties continue to have significant positivity. The Daily Star reported today, 40 active cases in Delaware County, 53 in Shenango, four new cases in Schoharie and one new death reported in Schoharie. Um, let's see here, this just graphically shows from today the, the rapid decline in active cases in the county. When I last reported to you in, in, on April 20th, we were uh, at about 130. So that's good. Uh, number of daily cases in the county really coming down. 
uh, wastewater. Um, the last data point I got was from a couple of weeks ago and we were still showing some positivity. Um, Greg, are you aware of any since that time? Yeah, sorry, Dan, I thought I forwarded that to you. I must not have. It was uh, less than limited quantification on May 10th, so trending in the okay. right direction. So trending down, and actually Greg and I are gonna meet with Dr. Larson, the epidemiologist from Syracuse, who's been working with us all along next week just to get some clear sense of of how the data can inform us going forward. Um, just a quick peek at variants. This data is a couple of weeks old, but this is what the most up-to-date uh, CDC graphics tell us. It just shows you that, you know, the B117, which is a UK variant, is still the predominant one in the United States, as well as, and this is our region, New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico. Um, purple, we have the New York variant and a little bit more of the P1, which is the Brazil variant. Um, these are variants of concern in that um, they may be more transmissible, potentially more um, cause more severe disease. As far as we know, however, even though they're variants of concern, most of our current vaccines are effective against these variants. Um, not surprisingly, there is now an India variant that is here in the United States, actually a number of them. Um, we are concerned that there may be, again, um, some reduced effectiveness of treatments as well as reduced susceptibility to antibodies, either natural or in vaccines, but that is all being studied and hopefully we'll be okay. Uh, Brazil variant also of a concern, which is probably driving the increase we're seeing, the sustained transmission we're seeing in Brazil. A brief word on vaccines. Um, again, here in Otsego County, as of today, we have 41% of all residents are now fully vaccinated. If we just talk about those over 18, it's 47%. Um, and a much greater number, 69% in those over 65. And this is about uh, where we are in the state. The, again, 43% of all residents and 52% of those over 18 in New York State are fully vaccinated. Just something to keep in mind um, with all this new change in um, guidance, both coming from the CDC and the state. Just let me step back here a minute. And in terms of um, local stuff, there are zero active cases reporting reported as of today from the SUNY campus and one from the Hartwick campus. Um, also in terms of vaccines, um, the governor announced on the 10th of May that all SUNY and CUNY students attending in-person classes in the fall will need to be vaccinated. Um, more to that in terms of our campus to follow. Um, Hartwick today did announce that all students, faculty and staff coming back in the fall will need to be fully vaccinated as well. Um, so as I'm sure we all know, as of last week, the CDC um, announced that all fully vaccinated people no longer need to wear a mask or physically distance in any setting, except where required by federal, state, local, tribal, or territorial laws. So know that um, the state and local municipalities still play a role in guiding mask and social distancing guidelines and um, things to take into account in, those, in that guidance are things such as um, local case rates as well as um, vaccination rates. Um, the CDC did clarify over the weekend that this, this guidance does not apply to schools K through 12. So at, for the time being in schools, masks are still required. Um, they are reviewing guidance for summer camps uh, now, and that guidance should come out shortly. Again, as many of you know, the governor beginning tomorrow has issued guidance for us for in New York State. And again, no, noting that 
pre-K to 12 schools, any public transit, uh, congregate settings such as homeless shelters, correctional facilities, as well as all healthcare settings, masks um, are still required. Otherwise, those of us who are fully vaccinated are no longer required to wear masks in either public or private set indoor or outdoor settings. But again, um, businesses, um, the state authorizes the businesses, businesses to continue to require masks so that they, they may continue to do so. I think the problem, the challenge will be um, the business, certain businesses being um, either required to ask all people to mask or to ask people to provide um, proof of vaccination. Some big um, businesses such as Walmart have already said that uh, vaccinated persons do not need to wear um, masks while, or employees need to wear masks while in their stores. Um, I think time will tell what other local businesses will do. Um, but I feel like we certainly should support them in um, encouraging mask use in indoor settings. I think we're, we're realizing more and more that outdoor settings are fairly safe. Um, but in indoor settings where people are close together, um, if unvaccinated without masks, um, the virus is still here, it can still spread. Um, so that my final point is that we may be close to here, hopefully, um, but that there is still a role for masks and social distancing. Um, and during this transition time, I think it's important we're just all patient with one another and especially uh, supportive of those uh, places in our community where we still do need to wear masks, such as public transport, and also still supportive of our businesses that require these of our community members. So that is my report. If there are any questions. Thank you, Dr. Jorgerson, um, for that report. And again, my apologies for making you wait so long. No worries. Hopefully and, you won't um, need me much longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll find a way to need you. The, um, uh, before we um, move on, um, just a reminder that um, uh, you're all invited to uh, tour the upper floors of the Ford Block building Thursday at four o'clock. The um, correspondence carry anything? There's nothing. I'm not aware of any executive session needed. Um, Dave Risberger. Gary, can you send out a note later of where we should meet exactly at four o'clock if we decide we're gonna take that tour on Thursday? Yeah, it's right right on Main Street. There's, an, there's a nondescript door that between two stores uh, uh, that um, leads to the staircase going upstairs. Okay. So, You'll, you'll see it's the only door that's between two stores. I don't remember which stores it's between. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, um, I'm sorry, Carrie, did you say there were correspondence or not? There's none. Okay, and oh, that's right. And executive session, I'm not aware of any. So with that, I think we had a productive meeting and I uh, thank everybody and have a, we are adjourned. Have a good night. Take care, folks.